Hello guys, you are on the Digital Program Live channel and today we will discuss the fundamental library for specialists working with data. NumPy is a popular library for scientific computing in Python. It serves for many important libraries in the Python for data processing and analysis. These libraries include Pandas, which is used for working with tabular data and solving tasks for data analysis. Matplotlib and Seaborn, that are used for data visualization and graphing. You may already be familiar with these libraries. If not, I recommend equating yourself with them. Tutorials are already available on my channel. SkyPy, this library provides functions for scientific computing, such as optimization, approximation, integration, and others. Scikit-learn and many other popular libraries in the Python ecosystem rely heavily on NumPy as a foundational library. NumPy serves as a building block for many scientific computing and data analysis libraries in Python, providing efficient numerical operations, memory-optimized data structures, and seamless integration with other libraries in the ecosystem. This library provides efficient broadcasting and views, allowing operations on arrays without creating a new copies, thereby reducing memory usage and improving performance. NumPy is a library that provides a powerful data structure, arrays, which allows representing large matrices and vectors, as well as set of functions for efficient work with them. The main advantage of NumPy lies in the speed of calculations compared to Python lists. This is achieved because all elements of the NumPy array have the same data type, and also due to the use of compact memory storage and optimized mathematical algorithms. Let's move on to the main features and benefits of NumPy. And these are a vast collection of mathematical functions that operate efficiently on arrays. Manipulation of large data sets without excessive memory overhead. Building support for reading and writing array data to and from various file formats. Also support for performing fast Fortier transforms, which are crucial for sino processing, image processing and other scientific applications. Powerful indexing and slicing capabilities allowing for efficient selection and manipulation of subsets of arrays. NumPy can be used to solve a wide range of tasks, such as mathematical operations, signal and image processing, scientific simulations, random number generation. NumPy provides functions for generating random numbers with various distributions, data analysis and manipulation. NumPy arrays can be used for data manipulation tasks, such as sorting, filtering and reshaping data, which are often prerequisites for data analysis and machine learning tasks. Machine learning and deep learning. NumPy provides the underlying data structures and operations required for machine learning and deep learning tasks. Well, NumPy integrates seamlessly with many other scientific computing libraries in Python, such as Pandas, Matplotlib, Scikit-Learn, facilitating a rich ecosystem for data analysis, visualization, and machine learning. This list highlights the versatility of NumPy and its ability to address a wide range of tasks in scientific computing, data analysis, machine learning, and beyond, making it a foundational library in the Python ecosystem. So let's go! To install the NumPy library, first ensure whether it's already installed in your Python environment. What is a Python environment? I have already discussed on my channel. I recommend to see this video. It allows you to switch between several Python versions and between several working environments without any errors or conflicts. Very useful tool. Highly recommend. So, since some other libraries may automatically install this NumPy library, to check its presence you can execute the following code in the command prompt or terminal pip show NumPy. If you receive a response with the specified path to the library, then NumPy is already installed. Otherwise, to install NumPy, use the command pip install NumPy. This command will automatically download and install NumPy from the Python repository. After successful installation, you can use NumPy for numerical computation and working with data arrays. 
it's recommended to periodically update your libraries, including NumPy, to obtain new features and fix potential bugs. To do this, use the command pip install upgrade NumPy. I'll execute it too, it's time for me to update as well. This approach will allow you to have the latest version of NumPy for your project. So, after updating, let's move on to the practice and start getting acquainted with the main element of this library, the data array. A NumPy array is the main data structure that distinguishes NumPy from regular Python. In fact, it's a table of elements of the same type. This can be integers or floats, logical values, strings, and so on. NumPy arrays are multidimensional. They typically take the form of vector or matrix, but can have an arbitrary number of dimensions. The number of dimensions and the shape of the array are fixed upon creation and can be changed. The elements of the array are numerically represented and packed in memory for efficient access, ensuring high computational speed. Note the axis. This is the index of the NumPy array dimension. It determines the orientation when applying operations. That's it. Each NumPy array has one or more dimensions of axis. For example, a vector has one axis, which is the number of elements in the vector. A matrix has two axes, the number of rows and the number of columns. And so on. Due to these properties, NumPy arrays are widely used in scientific computing, data analysis and machine learning. They provide a compact and efficient representation of numerical data. So let's import NumPy. Of course, we'll set an alias. It's more convenient to import NumPy with an alias, because then, instead of the long prefix NumPy, we can just write two letters MP. Let's consider the basic ways of generating arrays for further work. Let's start by creating arrays from a Python list. What are Python lists? They are one of the built-in data types that allow storing sequences or a list of other objects. For example, let's create a list A containing only numbers. But you should understand that a list can contain elements of different types – numbers, strings, other lists, objects, etc. For example, I've created a list B as an example to demonstrate this. The elements of a list are ordered. Each element has its own index, its position in the list. The length of the list, or number of elements in it, can dynamically change during program execution. The elements of the list are accessible by index, which starts from zero. For example, if we want to take the first element from the list A, we specify A, and in brackets we indicate zero. Thus, we have taken the first element from this list which has an index of zero. Lists can be iterated over in a loops, but we'll talk about that a bit later. In the future we'll have a video about Python and we'll discuss this in detail. So, lists are convenient for storing data of different types. On the other hand, the main idea of NumPy arrays is to use single data type, which allows optimizing memory usage. Lists in Python can store different types of objects, leading to additional memory consumption. This isn't a big deal if the list is small, but if we are talking about large amounts of data, using such lists can be very expensive. And here come NumPy arrays to the rescue. A NumPy array can be easily initialized from such a regular Python list. To do this, we execute the array function and pass our list A. But that's not all. I wonder how the numbers are stored in this NumPy list. Dtype will show us the data type used to store values in the array. And we see in 64 specified here. This means a 64-bit integer, which allows storing integers from very small to very large values. In NumPy, type and dtype refer to different concepts. When we talk about the type in NumPy, we usually refer to the type of the object itself. dtype, short for data type, refers to the type of elements contained within a NumPy array. And type already shows array data type. What if we make an array from list B? Let's see. 
Now I'll replace our list A with a list B. And look what we got. D type shows that despite the different data types in the Python list B from which we make an umpire array, as a result we get one data type for all array objects. Specifically, here we see U21, which means a string data type. That is a fixed length Unicode string of 21 characters. 21 is the maximum allowable length of the string in characters. If the string exceeds this length, it will be truncated. This allows for more efficient use of memory for this column. Since the data type is fixed, we can see that in the NumPy array, mixing of the types is not allowed. Here conversion to a string type was applied. NumPy has a variety of convenient functions for generating arrays according to specified rules without the need to specify each element. For this, there is a range function. Thanks to it, we can create a one-dimensional array, starting from 5, for example, and up to 10, but not including 10. That's it. It will end with 9. There is also the zeros function, which will create a one-dimensional array of zeros. Let's create an array of size 4, and we will get 4 zeros. Or there is the ones function, similar to zeros, but will get a one-dimensional array of ones. There are moments when you need to specify the data type of the array from the very beginning. For this we use the array function with the addition of dtype parameter. For example, let's create a one-dimensional array of type float. Let's print what we have obtained. These dots indicate that we have not just numbers, but float numbers. Let's execute dtype, and this confirms that currently all our elements are of type float. I'll remove unnecessary lines, delete print functions. Indexing in the array, like in a Python list, allows us to get the desired element by its position. Just like in a Python list, we can also take a slice from the array. For example, let's take the elements from the array from the very beginning up to, but not including, index 2. Remember that indexing in Python starts from 0. So the first element of the array has an index of 0. When we write the array name followed by a column and then specify an index, it means to take elements from the very beginning of the array up to the position with index i-1. We take the range from the beginning, which is the first element with index 0, up to i-1 inclusive. This is because in Python range boundaries are always specified as inclusive-exclusive. This is how slicing works in Python lists and NumPy arrays. Writing array column 2 will return elements from 0 to the first index. So we'll get two elements, value 1 and value 2. Let's change the slice and take elements from the second index to the end of the array. Here 2 is the index from which the slice starts inclusively. Then comes the column, which is the delimiter indicating the slice boundaries. After the column, there is nothing. This means we take elements all the way to the end of the array. And we get our elements 3 and 4. If we specify the index of a non-existent element, for example 4, we'll get an error, because 3 is the index of the last element in the array. Thus, using slicing syntax, we can obtain a portion of an umpire array within the specified index interval. This is often used in data processing. Now let's create a new two-dimensional array. How can we find information about the shape and dimensions of an umpire array? We won't count elements for this, for sure. There is a function called shape that returns a tuple of numbers corresponding to the size of the array in each dimension. For example, for a 3x3 three three matrix that we just created, we got the following result. Along the first axis, which is our rows, we have the number 3. And along the second axis, which is our columns, we also have the number 3. 
I'll slightly modify and add dimensions. Pay attention to the output of the shape function. We've added the number of elements. Now we have a three-dimensional array. Two by three by three. Remember that the difference between a matrix and an array is that a matrix is a specialization of an array. It strictly has two dimensions. Arrays can be multidimensional. The ending function returns a number corresponding to the number of axes or dimensions of the array. Here we have the number of nesting equal to 3. Also, using the size function, we can find out the total number of elements in the array. In our case, we have 18 elements, which is true if we multiply 2 by 3 and by 3. So, I'll remove the unnecessary parts so that it doesn't interfere. If you need to quickly initialize a NumPy array of a desired shape and fill it with a single specified value, you can use the full function. It allows creating an array by specifying the shape of the array as a tuple of integers, the number of elements along each axis. The second parameter adds the value with which the array will be filled. There is also a third parameter, dtype, which is optional. It specifies the data type of the array elements. I won't change anything in our array, just make it in one line. I want to explain nesting better. If we break down our array, we can see that it consists of two matrices, each of which has a dimension of 3 by 3. Thus, we have a three-dimensional array of size 2 by 3 by 3. By slicing from 0 to 1, we'll take a part of the three-dimensional array. Specifically, this expression selects subarrays starting from index 0 inclusively and ending at index 1 exclusively. This means that as a result we'll get only one layer or plane from our three-dimensional array and it will be our matrix consisting of three rows and three columns. Let's move from slicing to nesting and let's specify one. We do this to select the second row of our matrix which we just selected with index 0. Why one selects the second row? I think I don't need to remind you because row indexing starts from 0. So this construction returns the second row of the first layer or the first matrix in our three-dimensional array. This example illustrates how indexing and getting subarrays working in NumPy three-dimensional array. I want to show you one more way to get the same result. Let's slightly change the notation and get the same result. In NumPy these two notations they are equivalent, but the difference lies in the internal implementation and execution speed. This variant is usually faster, because NumPy can efficiently handle array accesses, while the first variant involves two consecutive accesses to the array. First, we get a subarray using zero, and then from this subarray we again get an element using one. This approach can lead to additional overhead due to sequential array accesses. The main difference lies in the use of indexing. If our second case uses a single indexing operation, then in the first variant there are two consecutive ones. In most cases it's recommended to use the second variant, as we did, because it's more efficient in terms of speed and more convenient to use. I'll slightly modify our array, and in the last matrix, which is the second one, I'll change the numbers, because you should see the difference. And now look closely. If we specify an index of minus 1, we indicate that we want to get the last layer of the array. That is, array minus 1 will return the following. This expression selects the last layer in our three-dimensional array, regardless of how many layers or nests the multidimensional array contains. In our case, we'll return the second matrix. We have only two of them, but if you have a multidimensional array with multiple nests, uh, you'll get the last element in that array. In our case, it's equivalent to just use index 1 in brackets, but using minus 1 allows making the code more flexible, because there is no need to specify the explicit number of nests in the array. If we add another one through a comma, 
it will be used to access a specific row in the last layer. That is, in our matrix we'll select the second row, which has an index of 1 of our second matrix. I advise you to experiment. Pause the video and try to take any number of elements from this array. Try to take the last row of the first matrix, the first element of our array, or the first row of the last matrix of our array. Practice, because only practice brings understanding. One theory will not be enough. And now let's get the third element from the row by simply adding an index. The third element has an index of 2, and here we have our digit 16. I remind you that this notation is equivalent to this one. Pause the video and try to get the first element of the last row of the last element of the array, namely our second matrix. I hope you succeeded. I'll leave minus 1 as it was, so we select the last element of our array. Next we need to take the last row in this element, so I can specify minus 1 again, and this way we will take the very last row. Then we take the first element. We know that indexing starts from 0, and we specify 0. And here we have our digit 17. I'll add a third element to our array. If I now specify an index minus 1, I'll get only the element that was just created. There are moments when we need to take a sub-array slice of our multidimensional array. I'll show you how it works. We will add 1 and a colon. So we've added a slice to the already selected sub-array. And in our notation we see minus 1. This indicates the last layer of the array. That's the third last element in our case. Here the 1 and the colon mean that starting from the line with index 1 inclusive and up to the end of the lines in this last element we take everything. And here's our answer. So uh, let's get another slice from a slice. Uh, let's see what we've got. I specify from the first element to the last one. And we'll essentially get a slice from a subarray. Or if we need to take instead of a slice just the elements with an index of 1 from each row of this slice, we simply specify 1 and we'll get two elements with an index of 1. And now pause and instead of taking the first elements, let's take a slice from subarray which will consist of the first two elements of each row. So it should contain 14. 115, 117, and 118. Well, we specify a slice starting from index 0 and up to index 2, exclusive. And that means we'll get 14, 115, 117, and 118 elements with indexes 0 and 1. Here it is. I'll remove the unnecessary parts. And let's get acquainted with the empty function. There are moments when you need to create an array of a specified size and fill it with values that you'll specify later. For example, I've created a new three-dimensional array using this function. But it's important to remember that arrays created using the empty function may contain any random data in memory, and they need to be initialized before use. To create a one-dimensional array with values evenly distributed within a specified range, we use linspace. The first parameter of the function shows us the starting value of the range. The second parameter is the ending value of the range. And the third parameter specifies the number of elements or points you want to obtain as a result. I've created an array with four numbers evenly distributed between 3 and 40 inclusive. Or let's create an array within 14 numbers from the same range. This function is useful when you need to create evenly distributed values, for example, for creating a vector of values for using plotting, graphics, or other analytical tasks. 
you specify how many points you need and what range of values you want to cover. Very convenient. Let's add negative numbers to our array, because for the next example I will need it. Now let's get acquainted with the absolute function. This function in the NumPy library is used to compute the absolute values of array elements. It will return a new array where each value will be absolute. This is useful in many cases, when you need to bring values into a positive range or simply get the absolute value for further data analysis. We've displayed our array, and now we see that there are negative numbers, but after the absolute function we no longer see minuses. The Dayak function in the NumPy library is used to create a square matrix with specified values on the main diagonal. In our case, 3, 4 and 5 are passed as a list argument to the function. This list contains values that you want to place on the main diagonal on the new matrix, so the result will be square matrix, where the main diagonal will contain values from the list 3, 4 and 5, and all other matrix elements will be zero. You'll get something very similar with the Diag flat function, but the difference is that Diag flat flattens the input list into a one-dimensional array and then places it on the main diagonal. So, if we have such an array, the Diag flat function will output it as if we had a one-dimensional array. All other matrix elements are zero. In this example, we've specified only one argument which indicates the dimensionality of the square matrix, in our case 6 by 6. The resulting matrix will form a triangle with ones below and to the left of the main diagonal. All other matrix elements will be zero. If I specify two arguments, the first argument indicates the number of rows in the matrix, in this case 6, and the second argument indicates the number of columns, in our case Two. The resulting matrix will form a triangle with ones below and to the left of the main diagonal, just like in the first case, and other elements will be also zero. We can experiment and change its shape. For the next example, I'll create the simplest one-dimensional array. Now let's get acquainted with the view function. It's used to create a new array that refers to our newly created array. So both arrays refer to the same data, but have different shapes. I'll explain how it works. Changes made in one array will be reflected in the other because these two arrays store references to the same data object. It's important to note that the view function creates a new object that refers to the same data, not a copy of it. Therefore, any changes made in one array will be reflected in the other. I'll take the first array and change its last element to 1. And we can see the changes have occurred in both arrays. So why do we need this function at all? You may encounter a situation in the code where one variable gets a reference to the same data object that another variable refers to. Even without changing the components of our first array, we'll change its shape. We will make a one-dimensional array look like a two-dimensional one. The array will remain the same. We'll just change its shape. And if we output the second array, which refers to the same object, we'll see that it has also changed its shape. On large projects, this can lead to unexpected errors, especially if you have a function that, for example, expects a one-dimensional array and instead something goes wrong and you get a two-dimensional, three-dimensional or some other form of array. In such cases, we use the view function. So it's not enough to create another variable and make a reference to the same data object. We create the same array appearance and this entity also refers to the same object. And now, if we create this shape of our first array, it won't affect the second array at all. If I create an array using the copy method, we will make a full clone of the original array. So our second array will be independent of the array from which we made it. 
It will contain the same data, but will have its own object in memory. Our two arrays represent different data objects with the same content at the time of copying, but further changes in one array will not affect the other. And we can see it here, we changed last element, our first array, and it didn't affect the second array. I remove unnecessary part and print previous array, just to remember how it looks. To change the way NumPy interprets element indices in our array without changing the data itself, we can use the shape function. If we reshape it to 27, we'll get a one-dimensional array. In this array, the elements will be arranged in the order in which they were stored in the three-dimensional array. However, it's important to understand that this is just our interpretation of the same data. The data itself remains unchanged. We can experiment with our array and represent its data in different ways. We are not creating a new array, we are simply changing the representation of the current array. The main thing is that the total amount of data remains the same, but according to the latest documentation, settings the shape using the shape method is not recommended because it may be removed from the documentation in the future. It's recommended to use reshape function for this approach. I change MRA form with reshape function and print it. Then I print MRA with shape 1 by 9 by 3 and we can compare it. Although we created a new array using the reshape function, we still didn't create a new set of data. Therefore, any changes we make to the array will also be reflected in our second array, as they both use the same data. If we change the first element of our current array, we will see that it's also reflected in our second newly created array. If you want the new array to be independent of the first one, you need to create a copy using the copy method. I print again an array, just remember how it looks. And let me introduce you to the Ravel function. It's used in the NumPy library to transform a multidimensional array into one-dimensional array, so to speak, flattening it. When we call Ravel on an array, it flattens all its dimensions and returns a one-dimensional array, placing all the elements in a single row in the order they were stored in the original array. This is a simple way to access all elements of the array, regardless of its dimensionality, in the form of a one-dimensional array. And now let's get acquainted with mathematical functions, how they work on one-dimensional and multidimensional arrays. Using the arrange function, I'll create a one-dimensional array. For example, the sum function will output the sum of all elements of our one-dimensional array. But if I now reshape our array using the reshape function, making it a bit larger, let's make it nine numbers. And let it be three by three for us. And here it is, we have multidimensional array. So if we want to use the sum function and apply it only to our rows or columns, we must specify our axis. This is how our array looks like now. If we simply apply the sum function, we will use the sum of all its elements, regardless of how many dimensions it currently has. And if we specify our axis, let's specify axis equals to 1, for example, you'll see that we get a list of sums for each row. If we specify the axis to be equal to 0, we will get a list of sums for each column. The mean function calculates the average value of array elements. We can also get either the average value of our entire array or apply our axis, as in the previous case, and depending on this, we'll get the average value by rows or by columns. Let's find the maximum number of our array using the max function, and it will be our number 8. Or let's find the minimum number, and it will be 0. We can also apply the axis. For example, now if I specify axis equal to 1, we'll find our minimum number by rows. Pause, experiment, and find the maximum number by columns. 
Well, it's quite simple. I think you did it. So we use max function and indicated x is equals to 0. We've familiarized ourselves with some array methods. If you want to learn more in detail, you can look at the documentation. Here we see our sum method, which we used in the example above, and much more. However, there are not only methods, but also functions in NumPy. You can check them out and get acquainted with them closer in the documentation. And here you can see that some functions are very similar to those methods we used above. However, there is still a difference. I won't delve into what a method is and what a function is. This will be the subject for our further course in Python. In NumPy, there may sometimes be confusion between what is a method and what is a function. For now, you should understand that the main difference is that methods are associated with objects. In our case, it's our array. And they are called through these objects. That is, we specify the array and then the method. Whereas functions are global and can be called directly from the imported NumPy library. For example, let's calculate the square root using such a function. I'll slightly change the array. I'll remove the shape. It's not very necessary for us now. Let's compute the exponent of our already one-dimensional array. Also, we can calculate sine or cosine using such functions. Or let's try to compute the natural logarithm of each element of the array and we get an error. We cannot divide by zero. Let's remove zero from our array. That's better. And now we have the correct answer without errors. The round method in NumPy arrays is used to round the values of array elements to the nearest integer. If I use this method on our array now, we won't see anything because we generated an array of integers. So I'll revert our logarithm function and then apply the round function after all this. This way it will be more clear. Also, the round method can take an additional argument. It's uh, the number of decimal places to which uh, the values should be rounded. For example, we can specify 3 or 1. To take it clearer what we did here, I'll rewrite the code just a bit. This notation is equivalent to this. We just shortened the view. For the next example, I'll generate an array where there are negative numbers. Let's do this. The random randint function generates an array of the random integers that can be negative or positive in the range from minus 50 to plus 50. Of course, you can specify this range and the number of elements as desired. So we will get such an array. And now let's get acquainted with the absolute value function. In the NumPy library, this function is used to compute the absolute value of array elements. It returns a new array where each element is the absolute value of the corresponding element of the original array. This function is useful when you need to get the absolute values of the array elements or a vector to work with data without considering their sign. Also, let's get acquainted with the argmax function. This function returns the index of the first occurrence of the maximum value in the array. The argmin function works similarly. It returns the index of the first occurrence of the minimum value in the array. In case the array has multiple elements with the same maximum or minimum values, the argmax and argmin functions will return the index of the first occurrence of such values. These functions are useful for finding the position of the largest and smallest elements in NumPy arrays. This can be useful in many algorithms and computations. There are cases when you need to generate random numbers for an array, and if we want these numbers to be reproduced in the same order, we need to get acquainted with the seed function. The seed function sets the initial value of the random number generator and allows you to set a fixed initial value for generating random numbers, making your code reproducible. If I set the initial value once, 
letter B0, for example. It means that we fix the initial value of the random number generator. This means that every time we generate random numbers using the mprandom function, we get the same sequence of numbers. This is very useful for the reproducibility of results, in case you need your random numbers to be the same every time your program is run. It can also be useful if you want to show something to someone and need to reproduce the behavior with the same array and the same sequence of numbers. The permutation function in NumPy library is used to create a random permutation of numbers. If we specify 6, it will be a random array containing numbers from 0 to 5, rearranged in random order. This function is often used when you need to shuffle or rearrange indices for further work with data or for a random selection of a subject of array elements. We can increase the array a bit. If I specify 16 here, we'll get a random array containing numbers from 0 to 15 inclusive, rearranged in random order. The random random function in our case generates a 3x3 three three array where each element is a random number with a normal distribution, or as it's also called, a Gaussian distribution. It's important to note that the random random function generates numbers with normal distribution with parameters that can be changed. For example, you can increase or decrease the number of elements in the random array by changing the arguments of the function. The append function in the NumPy library is used to add new values to the end of an array. It takes the following arguments. The first one is the original array to which we will add new values and the values we want to add. In our case, we added new values to our array in the form of a list consisting of three trees. The insert function in the NumPy library is used to insert new values into an array. We can specify a certain index. This function takes three arguments, the original array, the index at which to insert the values, and the values to insert. In our case, we are inserting two fours into the array at index position 2. The insert function doesn't change the original array, but creates a new one with the inserted values. To delete elements of an array at specified indices, we use the delete function. It takes three arguments, the original array, the indices of the elements we want to delete, and the axis. If axis is none, it will be applied to the flattened array. Let's see how it works with an example. Now we have deleted elements with indices 0, 1, and the last element from our array. After calling the delete function, it returns a new array without the deleted elements. The original array remains unchanged. If we need to delete a range of indices from the array, we can do it like this. We perform the delete function, specify our array, and use the numpy object c underscore to create a range of indices. We specify the range from 2 to 5. Remember that 5 will not be included. I missed the underscore, sorry. Thus, we delete elements from the array with indices from 2 to 4 and return a new array without these elements. And for the next example, I create a simple array. The array will be two-dimensional. I forgot parentheses. Sorry, let me add them quickly. In the delete function, there is also a parameter axis, which indicates the dimension along which we want to delete values. If we specify axis equal to zero, it means that we want to delete rows. So in our example, we delete the row with index 1 in our array. We get a new array without the row with index 1. I'll add a new one character to separate our two arrays. It will be better to see them, more convenient. If we specify axis equal to 1, then the column with index 1 is deleted. I create another simple array and will get acquainted with the concatenate function. The concatenate function in the library is used to join or concatenate arrays along a certain dimension. We use the function itself specify the arrays to be joined. They are passed as a tuple. 
and there is also an optional parameter axis in the dimension along which to join arrays. If we want to join arrays along columns, we must specify axis equal to 1. By default, axis is 0, which means joining along the first dimension of rows. We can specify 0 or not specify at all. This value will be the default. And we get our result. So the concatenate function allows joining arrays in multiple dimensions depending on the dimension you specify. For this example, I'll remove the unnecessary part and create two dimensional arrays. We'll get acquainted with the vStack function. This function is used for vertical stacking or concatenating two or more arrays along the first dimension of rows. We got an error because I forgot to add another parenthesis. Sorry. Now everything is correct. We specify the arrays we want to vertically stack. They are passed as a tuple. As a result, we get an array that contains concatenated rows from two arrays. This is a convenient way to concatenate arrays vertically, and it works with any number of input arrays. I'll copy these two lines for a new example. There is also the hstack function. It's for horizontal concatenation of two or more arrays. You may wonder what the difference is between concatenate, where we specify the axis, and our functions like vStack or hStack. The main difference between them lies in the syntax. That is, when you want to join arrays along certain dimension, you can use any of this function, depending on your preference and convenience. It's up to you. The only thing I want to note is that in concatenate we can specify the axis. And this allows us to concatenate arrays not only vertically or horizontally, but also along any axis, because axis can be not only 0 or 1, arrays can be multidimensional. I'll remove the unnecessary parts and create new arrays. I'll show another way to do it. The fromEter function in the NumPy library is used to create a one-dimensional array based on an iterator. It takes a sequence of values from the iterator and converts them into an array. We pass an iterator or a sequence of values from which we will create an array. You can also specify the dtype parameter, which is the data type to which the values of the iterator need to be converted. And there is an optional parameter, count, which is the number of values to take from the iterator. By default, this parameter is minus 1, which means taking all values. In our example, we create the first array of four numbers using range. And the second array we also create using the range function and specify that four numbers are from the range from 4 to 8 so that they are different from the numbers in the first array. The column stack function in the NumPy library is used for horizontal concatenation or stacking of arrays. We pass a tuple of arrays as columns of the new array that we want to concatenate. Let's print it out to see what we got. It's a convenient tool for creating new arrays, especially when you want to combine data from multiple arrays as columns. Here are our arrays. The first two we generated and the last one where they are already concatenated. There is a similar function, rowStack, but it's for combining data from multiple arrays as rows. In this case, the result is the same as if we used the vStack function. I'll add an empty line to separate the arrays for clarity. There is also the r underscore function. This function allows creating array by concatenating indices along rows. It allows combining indices along the first dimension. The c underscore function allows creating arrays by concatenating indices along columns. This allows combining indices along the second dimension, or columns of the array. I am showing you this so that you know the possibilities for concatenation. You'll choose what is the best for you. I'll remove the unnecessary parts, I'll delete to avoid clutter, and generate a new array of 10 numbers from 0 to 9. The hSplit function is used for horizontal splitting or partitioning of an array into subarrays. It splits the array horizontally into several subarrays with the same width. 
it take the original array we want to split as the first parameter and the second parameter is how many parts we want to split the array into. If we specify splitting into three parts, we'll get an error because 10 is not divisible by 3. But if I specify 5, then we'll get our arrays. We can also split into 2. For vertical splitting, the function vSplit is used. And if we try it now, we'll get an error because we have a one-dimensional array. I'll generate a slightly larger array and use the reshape function to form a new two-dimensional shape of the array. Let's run it. And there is an error because we can't split this array into two, but we can split it into three. I hope I don't need to explain why. Let me increase the array for the next example and make it three-dimensional. If we need to split the array not just horizontally or vertically, because there can be more dimensions if the array is multidimensional, the axis can be not only 0 or 1, we can use the array split function. It splits the array into the specified number of parts. The second argument is the number of parts, which is 2, and the third parameter is the axis. In this case, we specified axis equals to 2, so it's splitting along the third dimension. Remind you, axis equals to 2 is the third dimension. And here we see our array split into two subarrays along the third dimension. If we want to divide it into three parts along the third dimension, so the array split function will attempt to split the array into the specified number of parts, trying to maintain uniformity. But if that's not possible, it will create parts with different numbers of elements. In our case, we'll get three subarrays, two of which will contain data and the third will be empty. We can also experiment and split along axis 1 or axis 0. I suggest pausing here and experimenting. And now, for example, I'll create the simplest list and the simplest array. In Python, operations between lists and arrays have different natural behaviors. In the case of lists, the plus operation performs concatenation, that means joining two lists into one, but it doesn't perform arithmetic addition of elements. In the case of numpy arrays, the plus operation performs element-wise addition, meaning it adds corresponding elements of the arrays. Look at the difference between two print functions, between adding lists and adding arrays. We can also perform element-wise multiplication of two arrays of the same size or multiply each element by a number. If we do this with a list, we'll get the repetition of the list for the specified number of times. When you perform the minus operation, each element in the array changes its sign to the opposite of each number. The result of this operation will be a new array, where each element of the array is divided by 1. Instead of 1, it can be any number. Or we can perform element-wide remainder division of each array element by the number 2. The operation where we subtract a list from an array subtracts elements of the list from elements of the array. This operation is performed element-wise, meaning each element of the list is subtracted from the corresponding element of the array. But you can't subtract a list from a list, you'll get an error. Multiplying a list by a list will also result in an error. Now I want to introduce you with another thing. And for that I'll create one two-dimensional array and one one-dimensional array. There is also the concept of broadcasting arrays. Broadcasting is a mechanism in NumPy arrays that allows performing operations on arrays of different shapes or dimensions. If two arrays have different numbers of dimensions, new dimensions are automatically added to the array with fewer dimensions, until their sizes are compatible. In other words, we have the same number of digits in each row of the array. And when we add two arrays, the smaller array is concatenated row-wise with the rows of the second array. And for this example, I'll create the simplest array again. Let's get acquainted with combined operator. 
when we perform the addition operation, we can do it more succinctly. In this example, we are adding the number 5 to each element of the array and changing its initial value to the sum with 5. This operation is equivalent to using this notation, but it's done directly in the array without creating a new object. This is useful because it allows efficiently increasing or decreasing the values of all elements of the array without the need to create a new array. This can also be applied to other mathematical signs. Imagine you have a text file from which you want to load data. The gen from txt method is designed to read data from a text file and automatically determine data types. It's a powerful tool for working with data in formats like CSV, TSV, and other text formats. We are now loading data from the file data.txt, where the data is separated by commas. Then we specify delimiter equals to comma. This method can automatically handle missing values and other data peculiarities and we output them in a NumPy array. The save function in the NumPy library is used to save NumPy arrays in binary format in a file. This allows saving array data so that it can be used later without the need for reloading or recomputation. If we open the file created with the saved array, we won't see anything useful for us. But the load function is used to load such saved arrays back into the program's memory. It allows accessing the data of the array that was saved using the save function. These functions are very useful for working with large amounts of data and further processing them without the need for recomputation. The save.txt function in the NumPy library is used to save NumPy arrays in text format in a file. This allows saving array data in a format that is convenient for reading and editing. For example, I'll choose the CSV format. But you can specify extensions like TXT, CSV, data. I mentioned extensions that are quite common and are usually used for storing data in text format. However, save.txt can actually save data in any text file with any extensions you want. We see that our file appeared in the project directory. Now let's load it. The load.txt function is used to load data from a text file into NumPy array. It allows accessing data that was saved using the save.txt function. This is very similar to the mechanism we discussed in the example a little earlier, where we used save and then load. But it wasn't user-friendly. It wasn't readable for us. And here we can already see this file and what's saved there. These two functions are very useful for working with data in a format understandable to humans. They allow easily saving and loading data without the need to understand the internal structure of NumPy arrays. And for the next example, let me create a new array. Suppose we have two-dimensional array, representing some data. Let it be temperature in different regions. And we want to find the position of all elements that exceed a certain threshold. I define a variable threshold with a value of 30. This is the value above which we want to find the elements in the array. How we can do this? In NumPy there is a function that is particularly useful for finding the position of elements that satisfy a given condition. And this is argware function. Our condition returns the indices of the elements that are true in the boolean array, because this expression creates a boolean array where each element is true if it's greater than 30 and false otherwise. I print the original data array to provide context for positions of the elements. And then I printing the indices. These indices are returned as two-dimensional array, where each row is the coordinates of the element, row index and column index in the original array. And the output shows that the elements greater than 30 are located at the following position in the data array. We can see row 1, column 2, element 35, row 2, column 0, element 40, row 2, column 1, element 45, and so on.
In this example, I demonstrate argware can be used to locate the position of elements in the NumPy array that meet a specific condition. In this crash course, we've covered the most essential things for working with NumPy. I hope you found it interesting and not too boring, and you found this lesson useful. Once again, I want to emphasize that practice is the most important. I highly recommend pausing after each lesson and trying to experiment or repeat something manually, because theory is good, but you won't learn without practice. The best thing is your practice. Subscribe and not miss the new lesson. And for today, that's all. See ya!